take her out of here. So, looks like I purchased the Windows XP machine in 2023. Um, this here is actually uh, very similar to the original Windows XP configuration I had back in the day. And, um, it vanished through upgrades and migrating to different operating systems. But now I've gone, um, yeah, back to the future. And this is a Acer Veritron 7900 Pro. Um, that's the basic machine. And it's a, from around 2007, 2009, it's about time frame. So anyway, let's have a look at the um, front side first. It's got three five and a quarter inch um, bays, and only one of them is populated now, so this has a, um, a DVD player in it. And um, oh. then we have a floppy disk drive, and um, three and a half inch, and then it has uh, four USB, obviously 2.0. So not not um, fastest USB you can get, but um, very nice. Uh, and then it's got this kind of friction pad on the top. So if you put USB sticks on here, then they won't like fall. I thought that was nice. So if we look at the back, um, most interesting for what I intend to do with it is that it has an original parallel port, and then it has a um, nine-pin serial out serial port, and then. Um, the LAN is actually one gig, and that's actually quite quite special for the time time period we're talking about. So I wouldn't have, wouldn't have expected that one would find a one gig on board um, uh, interface. And then it has a graphics card with um, you know DVI and then legacy VGA connectors. So anyway, if we have a look in the side, um, sadly, even though it was extremely well packed. I must say that the person who sent it really tried to make sure that it wouldn't be damaged. It actually had uh, received a quite a serious crash into here, and this panel was actually off. It's a toolless um, back panel, but it, it was off, and um, the consequences um, uh, was that the, uh, the the fan was jammed into the core, so <laughs> it had no CPU fan. And, and in this uh, configuration, if you um, if the fan's not turning, then the machine won't start. You, you won't even get a memory test or anything, you won't get any beeps and boops. So it's just like completely dead. So that, that was my scenario when I first powered it up. It, was, um, <laughs> it looked like I had a dead machine. But um, yeah, when I noticed the fan wasn't um, you know, running, then I just moved it a bit and then it worked. And then the graphics card, it has a plastic holder in the bottom of the graphics card and, and that's broken off. I don't know if it broke off in the transporter or it was already broken, but the graphics card had shifted out just a little bit. I don't know if that had any, any impact on it not starting, but I pushed the graphics card in. Um, so if we look at some of the main specs, it's a Q965, Q963 Express chipset. It's got um, 4 gigabytes of um, DDR2, um, 533-667. I haven't actually checked what speed these are, um, but one of those. Um, it's got a 250 gig um, SATA hard drive. And then it's got an Intel Core 2 6320, which uh, has um, two cores running at 1.86 gigahertz. So it's, just, oh, it's, it's not a total pile of crap okay. from that pers from the um, general properties perspective. And then the NVIDIA, it has an NVIDIA G4 7300 LE graphics card. Oh, with a massive 128 megabytes of graphics. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not going to win any competitions with this graphics card. Um, when it comes to the operating system, I actually bought it with uh, Windows XP Pro 
German edition. I knew it had German edition. They, they actually said that they had German. So, um, so when I got it home, I thought it was just an easy matter of switching the language. And that turned out to be not really that easy to do. Maybe I've forgotten, but I couldn't get it switched from German to English. And um, I tried the usual, trying to look in for language packs. And that didn't work out for me, at least. So, um, so what I did is I uh, installed a Windows XP Pro 32-bit uh, English version. And um, to be able to do that, I had to um, uh, salvage the product, uh, the product code for the XP installation. So anyway, regarding the issue how to retrieve the um, product XP product code from a running system and um, then how to retrieve a XP Pro English CD illegally. I mean, it's, there's nothing illegal about any of the steps. Um, if, I don't know, maybe nobody's interested. But if somebody's interested in having a video about it, then just put a yeah, add, add it as a comment to the video. Then I, I'll, I'll consider making a video about. It. Uh, and I mean, then one can say that okay, why this configuration? Because I'm interested in uh, going um, back in time, but not too far back in time. So I'd still li like to have a 32-bit base OS and. Um, related command prompt because that gives you access to 16-bit OS and then you have the option to switch it into Windows 95 mode and, and stuff like that. You can run applications in Windows 95, 98 mode. So it gives you kind of, you can go, yeah, not super long back in, the, in history, but um, enough for what I want to do. Um, I was successful on um, digging up all the drivers for this online from various sources and uh, you, you need to actually um, consider this uh, a few things when you're going to get an old machine you, you shouldn't just go ahead and buy one you, 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 it, because um, it might end up in problems <laughs> So I, you, you, need, you need to generally uh, like have an understanding, is there a replacement hardware available for what you're targeting? Because you could, you, I could have ended up with a dead, with a dead box. So, you know, it's a, and if I had gone way too far back in retro time, then actually fixing it or getting replaced parts would have probably been pretty impossible. The also, the thing is, with, uh, with, as the years go by and, and, and age becomes a factor, um, then it, you can run into issues with the onboard capacitors, either in or actually even with the power supply capacitors, or and those are nasty things to deal with. So, also capacitors when they go bad, they can um, leak electrolytes and they can just basically corrode your motherboard. So, yeah, if one is not really um, knowing what condition one's getting the hardware in. Uh, and and the way to, the, the easiest way to avoid most of those problems is to actually see the one doesn't go too far back in time. Uh, one should make sure one actually has access to the Windows license key. Better than than trying to retrieve it from a running system because it's not directly available in XP. You can't just go to a menu and say "Show me product." That doesn't exist. So um, usually. On quite a lot of these machines from this period, you actually have a sticker which has the product key on it. Now, this one didn't come with that because I know Acer, what they do is the, uh, I, back in the day I bought Acer systems and they actually have the sticker you're supposed to have on the machine. They included in the, in, in the, um, the bag with the manual. So, so if you're not one of those users that cares to take out the sticker, and actually physically put it on the machine, then you uh, you won't have it, which is a bit sad. So, but you need to make sure you uh, actually can have the Windows license key. Or if you're just going to reformat it, then maybe you don't care. Um, 
And then balancing going back in time, but sort of not losing too much convenience, like you know, going back to machines that never had uh, USB ports or um, like this. This this has a P PCIe bus, and if you went back to time to computers that only had ESA bus, then you know both hardware finding the cards and then, or actually predominantly, be more like finding. Uh, any kind of working drivers is, is going to be an issue. And, and as I said, mentioned before, driver availability. And I was able to kit this out with 100% of the drivers um, that it needed. So I have, I have no um, uninstalled devices in, or unrecognized devices in the device manager. Uh, and it's important to also to define your, like I've done with this, I've defined my use case and I'm going to stick with it. So, you know, don't consider you go buy one, one of these ancient computers and then you suddenly want to start upgrading and stuff because you'll end up, it'll end up costing you way too much. So it's better to actually say, okay, what do you need it for? So anyway, it comes down to the issue of why did I get it? Um, I'm actually interested in uh, what one might consider retro lab equipment with connectivity. So I'm not so far back into retro lab equipment that it's like uh, purely standalone uh, pieces of equipment that don't have any serial ports or PPIP ports or any other kind of or, or network ports. Uh, so mainly in the, in the range of uh, lab equipment that I'm interested in, they have serial port, TPIP, and possibly some of them communicate using the parallel port. So, so, and um, lots of that air equipment come with floppy disk drives, and uh, specifically HP equipment has special handling of those floppy disks uh, in terms of formatting them and accessing them and copying them. And, and what well, most of the utilities that do that need, uh, if you're not using floppy emulators, which is a totally different story, then um, you need a physical floppy disk drive with the controller on the board. Uh, it, those utilities will not work with um, USB-based floppy disk drives, at least in my experience. And then to be able to like run low-level retro development and utility software, there's, oh, there's so much software out there. Is this freely downloadable? Uh, and in many cases, there's no new equivalents for them. If I get some her heritage uh, or l retro um, lab equipment with um, serial connectivity or other types of connectivity, then um, and they have controlling software that you can run. They, there's no, there's nobody made newer versions of those. The equipment's gone obsolete. Uh, it's actually in some cases this uh, uh, many of these um, control software that runs uh, using serial port communication. It's very hard to run them through emulators like you know, VirtualBox or DOSBox or you know emulation. Just uh, practically speaking, just uh, it's not. It doesn't. It either doesn't work at all, or it's just. Um, absolutely not reliable so so when you have a machine that actually has a serial physical serial port physical uh, serial port controller uh, then those software they run much better um, yeah so that's the breakdown so I uh, will be um, involving this in several videos moving forward because it will be my platform to handle the retro lab equipment for floppy disks uh, controlling retro equipment, running old um, utilities of various kinds, and um, I think that start having Windows XP as the basis, and then one can go using that platform. One can go quite far back because I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to go so far back with the lab equipment that it actually has no communication at all. No, of course, I wouldn't need this machine. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I didn't think I would find myself buying a um, Windows XP machine in um, 2023, but for my use case, I think it's actually necessary. And um, <laughs> of course, the what I paid for this, uh, it was like 
uh, around a hundred dollars shipped so yeah I, I can't remember what I paid for when I was buying this type of equipment in the day probably thousand five hundred bucks something like that. <laughs> at least I, at least I got it cheaper anyway so that's the rundown and um, hope you got some informative information out of this uh, I will be putting in the video uh, comments uh, a little bit of details for example where did I get drivers from um, uh, I don't know maybe a hint how to retrieve the product code from the run, from a running system but I don't know I, I think there it's not that often that one hasn't got the um, for the, this type of off-the-shelf computer, most often they do have the licensing sticker on the on the machine. So uh, usually, not being able to get the product code is not, not really a super big problem. Yeah. Ah, so that's it, and um, see you in the next one when I put this to use. Yeah, bonus fact. If you actually want to open the back cover, then it's got this lever here. I didn't notice that first. So you push the lever down, and then you can pull off the back panel. If you don't push the lever down, you're going to have a big problem getting the cover on. But it's a neat mechanism, as I said, tool, toolless back panel, so I'm happy with it. Now that I understand how it works.